Today marks the start of my 20th year at Yes Prep. In fact, here's a picture of me 20 years ago in my first year at Yes Prep. I taught sixth grade math as the famed hero, Al Jebra. Yes, I'm here to tell you I am in fact Algebra Man. I dreamed of celebrating this special day with all of you, especially with Keith DeRozier, Leanne Rayburn, Nellie Martinez, and Pierre Urban, the four people at Yes who've been here even longer than I have. Pierre, Nellie, Keith, and Leanne, I got nothing but love for you guys. Once again, we dominated the U.S. News and World Report rankings. All of our eligible high schools were in the top 10% of all schools in the nation, over 17,000 in total, including those with highly selective admissions. Congratulations, Cavaliers, Explorers, Force, Legends, Marvels, Mavericks, Trailblazers, and Wizards for once again receiving this well-deserved recognition. And congratulations to the Pride and the Titans for being on this prestigious list this year. None of these results happen without our tremendously talented teacher core. So teachers, thank you for your hard work and sacrifice that led to these amazing results. I'm especially proud to congratulate the 34 teachers who earned advance this year, bringing our total number of advanced teachers to 111. Advanced teachers, congratulations on earning this highest distinction at Yes Prep. Second, I'd like to share a quick financial update. For the fourth year in a row, we ended the year at or under budget. At Yes Prep, we are deeply committed to the idea of access for our students and families. And access to technology is an equity issue that our financial prudence allowed us to aggressively address this year. To that end, we invested millions of dollars in technology and we ordered over 15,000 laptops so that every single Yes Prep student, kindergartners through seniors, would get a Yes Prep issued device this year. Finally, we responded swiftly to the COVID-19 pandemic. Within one week of physically closing our schools in March, doesn't that seem like another lifetime ago? We launched Keep Yes Prep Learning and connected with 98% of our students virtually. Recognizing that our schools provide food security for many of our families, we have now served over 342,000 meals during the pandemic. We've also raised over $625,000 in a relief fund that has all gone directly to families with the greatest need, holding true to our deeply held equity value that those who have the least always deserve the most. Special thank you to the members of our support teams and non-instructional teams who have worked tirelessly to meet the needs of the Yes Prep community. Your work is often hidden in plain sight, but we see it. We see your work, thank you. That's where we've been, and now a few words on where we are. Candidly, this summer has been the most challenging time of my 22 years in public education, and I know the same is true for many of you. From personal health issues and financial challenges to the unjust war that is being waged on black bodies, many of us feel assailed on all sides. We are understandably fearful, and many of you are justifiably angry. Small in comparison to the burden of racism or the burden our frontline healthcare providers face, I have also felt the burden of the decisions I must make as our leader to ensure that students continue to learn and that we minimize the risk to the entire Yes Prep community, that we do everything in our power to keep you safe. I take both of these responsibilities extraordinarily seriously. Yet amidst these troubling times, there have been glimmers of hope. This summer, the Supreme Court finally banned the discrimination of LGBTQ employees in the workplace, just as far too long in the making. To our LGBTQ teammates, you have been and will always be fully welcomed and protected at Yes Prep. Just a few days later, the Supreme Court ruled to protect DACA, a program that benefits many, many Yes Prep students and staff members. To our Dreamer teammates, you will always have sanctuary here. These cases remind us of the intersectionality of justice and equity, that none of us are free until every single one of us is free. And though there is much work to be done, there is nonetheless a glimmer of hope that needs to be recognized. This summer, George Floyd's and Breonna Taylor's horrific murders and the murders of so many other black Americans galvanized a national effort to address, fight, and permanently end institutional racism and police brutality. 
Injustice, though woven so deeply into the thread of our nation since before its founding, will not go quietly, will not go quickly. Yet there is nonetheless a glimmer of hope to be recognized. And I understand that my privilege affords me hope where others might feel anger, fear, and sadness. Yet it is only by holding tightly onto these glimmers of hope that I have found the personal courage to face the challenge of the new year and to will myself to reignite my passion for our work. So as I turn our focus to where we're going in the new year, I invite you from whatever personal place you are re-entering the work to join me in reigniting Yes Prep. This year we have four strategic initiatives, yep, just four, that will guide everything that we do and that we will use to measure our success at the end of this year. First, and intentionally because I don't want it to get overshadowed by anything else, we are going to become an increasingly anti-racist organization. I say increasingly because this is perpetual work. It's work that we've been engaged in for years now, but this summer was a stark reminder that despite our progress, there is so much more work to be done. And though we've made progress in the past, the pace of change wasn't nearly rapid enough. The great American poet Langston Hughes wrote, the kids who die are iron in the blood of the people. I am personally sorry for moving too slowly, and you have my word that the kids who died will be iron in my blood to lead our response boldly moving forward. Yet the work does not solely rest with me and the leadership of Yes Prep. Racism is an insidious evil that penetrates every organization in our country, sadly Yes Prep included. Yes Prep is comprised of diverse identities that are not immune to racism, anti-blackness, or the role of white supremacy in schools. Non-black people of color can also be victims of internalized, oppressive, and colonial mindsets that promote anti-blackness. Colorism is a specific ill that we must address between our brown and black students. Such a complex problem will require that every single member of the Yes Prep team plays an active role in becoming an increasingly anti-racist organization. No one sits this out. This summer, working closely with me and my team, the board of directors of Yes Prep unanimously adopted a resolution in support of the black community of Yes Prep. Resolutions find their resolve in action, so I've asked the board to hold us accountable, to specifically hold me personally accountable to the commitments in that resolution and the commitments that I shared with you earlier in the summer via an email. These commitments are in motion and you're gonna receive a detailed report in the look Yes Prep's internal annual report that will be shared with all of you later this week. I commit to reigniting Yes Prep by leading us to become an increasingly anti-racist organization. Please join me. Second, we are two weeks away from welcoming the first elementary students in the history of Yes Prep. This is a moment I have been waiting for since I left my HISD elementary school to join Yes Prep in August of 2001. I had a chance to tour Southeast Elementary School earlier this summer, which is just a stone's throw away from where my wife Erica and I started our work with Yes Prep in the summer of 2001. I've dreamed of this day literally for decades, and the families we serve have as well, calling out for Yes Prep Elementary Schools for many, many years now. So to the North Central Elementary team and the Southeast Elementary team, thank you for all that you are doing to get us ready for this monumental leap for literally helping fulfill the dreams of so many of us. I commit to reigniting Yes Prep by working diligently to ensure the successful launch of our elementary schools. Please join me. Third, we will develop and implement a comprehensive advocacy and marketing strategy to ensure the long-term sustainability of Yes Prep. Advocacy is on the path to justice. And so to manage our advocacy work, we've hired a managing director of advocacy who has extensive experience lobbying in Austin. And she's gonna be joining the team later in August. If you are personally motivated to become more deeply involved in our advocacy work, be on the lookout because later this semester, we're gonna be re reaching out for ways to get involved in this work. In addition to developing a robust advocacy strategy, more specifically, we've also decided to make Election Day a Yes Prep holiday this year. This will allow Yes Prep staff members to fully participate in the election process, including encouraging our families and eligible students to register to vote and also beginning to think creatively about ways to support families to exercise their vote on Election Day. In my lifetime, the stakes have never been higher, 
the risk to justice for the families we serve and for our teammates never more acute. This year, Yes Prep will dive deeply into the work of advocacy, as if lives depend on it, because indeed they do. To that end, I commit personally to reigniting Yes Prep by using our advocacy strategy as a powerful lever for justice and equity. Please join me. Finally, and what I know for many feels most urgent, we are committed to reopening the school year in a way that prioritizes the health of staff and students and that's responsive to the rapidly evolving pandemic and that ensures that students continue to learn. I've shared many details of our reopening work in my weekly emails to you and I also participate in weekly calls with the principals where we're working together to create campus-based plans and communications to keep you safe and informed. And you're gonna hear more specific details from principals during your in-service. And you'll also hear more about our reopening plans next Monday uh, as in part two of kickoff. So today I'm going to focus on our values related to reopening. In all my reading over the last five months, nothing has rung truer than the words of Dr. Shayla Griffin. In an article she wrote, some students should go to school, most should stay home. Dr. Griffin writes, here is the dilemma for those who care about equity, social justice, and science, meaning all of us. There are at least two competing justice issues on the table. The risk of not having school for the students most marginalized, and the risk of school spreading a deadly disease to the students and families who are most marginalized. Choosing to address one inherently worsens the other. She goes on to argue that there's no way around this basic fact, the impossible tension we face as educators. Across the country, we have watched as a tragically polarized nation retreats into binary choices. One group arguing, correctly I might add, that if we focus solely on academic and social emotional losses and rush to reopen schools, then we at our own peril ignore the real possibility that our efforts to educate might kill those for whom we care the most about. Another group arguing again, correctly, that if we're only concerned about the risk of spreading COVID, then we risk the realization of the long-term aspirations of the children in our care. Both of these risks are real. Both of these concerns are true. The answer to this dilemma, as it often does, lies in the nuanced middle. It is our task, a task that has been thrust upon us, but nonetheless our task to determine the path through a seemingly impossible challenge. Earlier this month, I had a long conversation with my mom. Hi, mom. And she said, you know, Mark, the silver lining of an impossible situation is that there's no way you can actually succeed. As I sat with that, the simple truth of it struck me. Our expectation isn't perfection. It's simply to do our best. As I seek to lead us through this pandemic, I can't commit to leading perfectly. I have already made mistakes. I will make mistakes. We will all make mistakes as we navigate a once in a lifetime, once in a century challenge but I commit to striving to do my very best. I ask for your grace and patience, and as you need grace and patience navigating your own challenges, you will have them as you strive to do your very best. Finally, I commit to reigniting Yes Prep during this pandemic by leading with integrity and transparency, by leading with grace and patience, and I commit to always, always prioritizing the health and safety of the Yes Prep community. Please join me. Before I close out our time today, I want to invite you to part two of kickoff next Monday, August 17th at 9 a.m., where Nella Garcia Urban, our chief program officer, and Philip Wright, our chief schools officer, will share the vision of schools and program for, up, for the upcoming school year. Last month, with the passing of John Lewis, we lost one of the greatest equity warriors in the history of our country. In his published last words, Representative Lewis charged us with this. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of this nation. I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. Facing these pandemics, I often feel ordinary, yet I am reignited by the extraordinary vision of Yes Prep. For 20 years, one of the highest callings of my heart has been the mission and vision of Yes Prep, as I know it has been for so many of you. This year is gonna be a year like none other, a year that will feel impossible at times, but a year where we will, where we must stand up for what we truly believe and use the conviction of our highest callings to reignite our work for our students and for each other. Please join me 
and reigniting. Yes, prep. Thank you.